Good day, dear listeners. Steve Preda here with the Management Blueprint Podcast. And my guest today is Robert Briel, the CEO of Briel Media, an expert in media buying in the areas of connected TV, streaming services, digital audio, digital out of home, display, search, and social media. Robert, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Steve. Appreciate it. So uh, let's start with your entrepreneurial journey. Uh, through, um, I hate to say that four failed businesses to finally, but finally founding and growing at three times Fortune 5,000 business. That's a real American success story, isn't it? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So when I started Brill Media, uh, I started four different companies. Uh, one was an influencer marketing company. One was me being the influencer in the food space. One was a consulting firm and one was a social media company. And I didn't have any real level of expertise in any of those. Um, at that moment in time, I had spent about 10 years in the advertising business. And the thing I was the best at, my my zone of genius, as it were, was uh, media buying, running ads for corporations, Sony, Disney, Capcom, Bacardi, Toshiba, Pe Toshiba PetSmart, et cetera, ConocoPhillips, Fortune uh, 5 company. And... It took me a few years to realize that the thing I need to be doing is the thing that I do the best, which is media buying. And media buying is another way of saying advertising. And advertising is when you spend money to deliver your message. So if you're spending money with Facebook or Hulu or X or LinkedIn or TikTok or Google search, uh, you're advertising. Uh, if you're not advertising, it means you're, social, you're posting on social media, you're doing search engine optimization, whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. Um, I started a bunch of companies, and uh, the thing that was the best for me is media buying. And once I really focused on media buying, I fundamentally realized that where I need to focus my time and energy is where I have the most competitive advantage. I have an unfair advantage because I'd been doing this for so long for so many big companies. And once I really focused on that, things started to fall into place. It was never easy. None of this is actually really easy. But I think what's interesting is when you determine that you're going to do something, then even the problems you have, the solutions start to come to those problems. And for the longest time, I tried not to deal with the problems of going into the media buying business, which is I didn't know how to sell. And financial risk is a big is a big thing. It's a big part of the business. So I didn't want to deal with that. And as a result, um, I put it off. And when I started to deal with those challenges, solutions came into focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so true. Um, I think it's Tony Robbins who says that where attention goes, energy flows. Uh, so it's basically, uh, you know, we are infinitely uh, resourceful. If we have to solve a problem, uh, we, we do. And I think the great entrepreneurs are the ones who are willing to put themselves in harm way and into very stressful situations and, and force those uh, reserves to come to the surface that are in, in uh, latent in all of us. So that's great. So you're in, in this business now. Uh, so tell me, how does this connect to your personal why? What is your personal why? Why are you uh, doing what you're doing and what drives you as an individual? Right. My personal why is a few things. Number one, I really enjoy the business. I really enjoy being in business. I really enjoy having opportunities to grow having opportunities to become a better version of myself. And all of that is going to be really valuable for what motivates me. I had this vision when I was a kid. When I say kid, I mean like in college in 21, 22, 23, et cetera. And I really wanted to make sure that I was successful. And being successful to me meant not having to deal with struggling with money. Mm -hmm. And not having to struggle with money meant that I had achieved enough and I was valuable enough to organizations that I was worth getting paid a, an amount, a living wage, basically. And I thought, man, how am I going to actually do that? Because like, you know, my parents, very modest, lived in an apartment their whole, their whole lives, emigrated, sorry, emigrated from uh, Europe, uh, Romania specifically. The luck of the draw, they, they never bought a home and et cetera. My dad was a civil engineer. Uh, my mom worked in the dental space working... Uh, uh, places that made uh, crowns and bridges for teeth and all that stuff. I was like, man, there's no like fallback for me. There's no position where I'm going to inherit anything and it's going to cover me. It's like, I have to do this. And so I think that grit and tenacity and or fear and or holy cow, there's no safety net, whatever you want to call it, all of that 
wrapped into this concept of I've got to like figure out a way to make it work. And as I think about why I became an entrepreneur, I've always just wanted to be better. Like I never would have been had the title of CEO had I not created one for myself. And yeah. I like the game. The game is fun. Even when I'm losing, the game is interesting. I hate losing, but we all lose sometimes. And it forces you to become better. And it's like it's like a mindset thing, right? Like either either the loss or the fail is is a reflection of who I am, or the the loss or the failure is a reflection of what I need to learn to build muscle to become better. So I choose to see the world that way. Love it. Yeah, I, I find this fascinating. I didn't realize you were uh, your parents were from Romania. We actually moved from Hungary over here. So ah, very next close. Door neighbors, next door neighbors, as it turns out. Just interestingly, so my parents grew up in, uh, or my, my mom, my, my dad grew up in Bucharest. They met here, not in Romania. They grew up in a town called Hermannstadt, which is a uh, Sibiu. And um, apparently, like, you know, in o over the course of hundreds of years, sometimes it was part of Hungary, yeah. sometimes it was part of Romania, sometimes it was part of like the Iron Curtain with Russia. So you have like this, this, this amalgam of different languages and hung Hungarian, I think my grandma who just passed away, she, she spoke Hungarian a little bit. She was a polyglot. She spoke English, Hungarian, German, Romanian, four or five languages. Yeah. That's insane. Lots of talent yeah. in this part of in this part of the world, um, out of necessity. So again, necessity is the mother of invention. Um, right. And uh, the uh, the harder the circumstances, the more the resources, uh, res more resourceful the people are. So um, let's let's uh, switch gears here and let's talk about the framework that you developed with Brill Media, or maybe over uh, even before. This is a broadcast of frameworks, and uh, I was very excited when you told me about. Mm -hmm the meta framework. Yeah. Uh, so tell me what the meta framework is all about and how do you use to, to really, uh, you know, buy media and target your advertising well. Yeah. So I'll tell you the V the version 1.0, and then I'll tell you the version 2.0, because there's a version okay. 2.0 since we last talked. Um, the version 1.0, which is still valuable and is still in deployment, three steps. On meta, you want to target broad audiences, age, gender, and location. So step one, target broad audiences. The reason for that is Meta is really good at finding who your best customers are. And the more limitations you put on Meta, the less likely it'll perform effectively um, for most campaigns, especially if your campaign needs to be always on, like you're going to need sales tomorrow and then five months from now, and then 12 months from now, et cetera. So you want to train Meta's machine learning algorithm to find who your best customers are. First step on that, broad targeting, age, gender, and location you don't wanna do narrow targeting. So narrow targeting is interest targeting, keyword targeting, lookalike targeting, or um, retargeting, serving ads to people who recently went to your site. The reason for that is because when you do the broad targeting, Meta does all that for you. And I'll give you an example of how that works. If you're selling shoes, for example, if someone, if a user goes to a competing website and puts a shoe in the cart and abandons cart, then Meta will know that and serve your shoe brand instead. So it, it does all that stuff for you. It's really powerful. So the first step, broad targeting. The second step is a creative testing framework. And the creative testing framework is this idea that you're going to create five ads per month. And five ads per month are going to be comprised of a headline at the bottom, image or video in the middle, and then primary text at the top. Those five ads, you're going to disassemble them and combine them in all the different possible combinations, which will yield 125 possible ad variations. You're not going to run 125 ads. That would be too expensive and, and take too much time. Instead, you're going to use control and variable testing. You're going to use science powered by Meta's algorithm to identify which are the top ads out of the 125. So in a day, you're going to go from 125 ads down to 20. And then for the next two to three weeks, you're going to optimize to leads and sales or sales, depending on what your business needs. And you're going to use dynamic creative. And then you're going to basically run, run those ads until one ad emerges as the winner. So you went in one month from you've created five ads, you had 100, 125 possible variations, and you know which one ad is your all-star ad. And you cycle through this process monthly. So that's the process. And the third step is the result of it. You understand the products 
services, audiences, and discounts that resonate for your customers right now. So that's the that's the version 1.0 of this process. Wow, that's already complicated enough. What was the last one? Uh, products, services, offers, discounts. Okay. So that's the version 1.0. Now the version 2.0 is actually a lot easier. So the version 2.0 of this process starts with understanding who your customers are. And the way you understand who your customers are is you look for problem statements. Mm -hmm. Problem statements are the things that people say when they're in their heart and soul, they just feel dissatisfied with something and they need a solution. Mm -hmm. So how do you get problem statements? You get problem statements by listening to your customer service calls, listening to your sales calls, or going to social media to identify like what people are saying about businesses like yours in the industry and the problems that they're facing. So whether you're talking about an interior design or shoes or marketing, podcasting, whatever the case is, what are the problems that people communicate about that? Mm -hmm. And then you run $25 tests to understand which of the problem statements are the most intense for your customers. And you look at data on Meta to understand that. And then you cycle through a bunch of tests and you start to understand the problems, the solutions, and the imagery that works really well to compel your people to spend money with you. You never stop testing. And this is a lot simpler of a test as well because it's it's more understandable. It's like people understand what problem statements are. It's, it's just easier. Mm -hmm. And the result of that is you lower lead costs. You, you lower the cost to acquire a customer because you're telling people exactly the problems that they're facing. And... The best part about it is you don't have to think about, you're not waiting for your customers to tell you what their problems are because c customers don't all, don't often know what their problems are and they aren't usually able to express what their problems are in a way that's meaningful for your business. Mm -hmm. So instead of doing a survey, you can go to social media where you have people who voluntarily actually tell you what's in their heart and soul, the problems that they're facing in language that you can use for your ads. Mm -hmm. And that's going to far more effectively resonate. So where do you marketing. find them? Where, where on social media do you find these problems? Reddit, X, LinkedIn, you go to chat GPT. So for example, for digital marketing, right? We're doing this for ourselves. I'll give you one problem statement I have up. One problem statement that really resonates is I need a partner who can handle big campaigns so we can target larger clients confidently. Another one that does really well the biggest problems I see in my agency are due to people. This impacts growth. Mm -hmm. Remember, we're targeting, so I didn't say this, but we're targeting agencies. We're a white label advertising partner for agencies. They do the creative work. We do the ad buying. Yep. So I'm saying, what are the problems that agencies have in order to grow? And I can say all kinds of things. What I say is grow your client relationships and earn more revenue without having to deal with staff. But that doesn't sound as interesting as the biggest problems I see in my agency are due to people, this impacts growth. That's fascinating. So if you're talking about the meta framework 2.0, you mentioned the three steps. So understand the customers, the mind, the problem statements. And number two is around the $25 tests to find the most instance problem statement. So is this the same way as you do in 1.0 that you create five variations and then 125 permutations and then you narrow it down or that's a different no, approach? It's a different approach. So the so what you're going to do with your ads on the, on the version 2.0 is you're going to create 10, 20, 30 different problem statements. You run them as ads. You run them as traffic campaigns. So you're getting a lower cost per thousand impressions. So the cost for the impressions is lower. And you're looking for at least a 1% click-through rate and a 50, per, uh, 50 cent cost per click. There's variation to that, but that's a good rule of thumb. And you're running about 400 impressions. And when you're doing that, you can say like the ones that have a very low click-through rate just aren't that interesting to your audience. The mm -hmm. ones that have a higher click-through rate are interesting to your audience. And so then, and you're running like, like I said, 10, 20, 30 different ads. It might cost more or less than $25, depending on the situation. And you're constantly cycling through this. So then when you have a problem statement, like the one that's uh, the biggest problem I see in my agency are due to people, this impacts growth. Then you test problem solution statements, which are your headline, like scaling up, we're your media buying crew. 
expert media buying solutions without the staffing hassles. Right, so now I presented the problem. I need to find an image that works, and then I have a headline that solves the problem. Yeah, and then you take all the language and you put it into your landing page, because now you don't need to write marketing copy. It's been written for you because you know what resonates with people, and then you cycle through a variety of tests with your landing pages with the same thing, and then you create an offer. What do people who are having staffing hassles? What do they want to see? Well, they may want to see. Uh, a breakdown of all the money you you save by not hiring a media buying partner, for example. Yeah, this is fascinating. So obviously you're a very systematic uh, thinker, and I love how you put this together. And I particularly like the contrast of the problem statement and flipping it into a solution statement. Yeah. And then you basically test your problem statements before you flip them. So what are the most powerful problem statements? Find the solution statements, test that as well. So it's two levels of testing. And then you add the imagery, which is the third uh, dimension to it. And then you rinse and repeat. So every month you do the same thing? No, every day you do the same thing. Wow. So these ads have a short uh, shelf life that they need to be refreshed all the time? No, no. So the testing, you're doing the test continuously. You never stop testing. As your funnel, as your purchase process gets more refined, excuse me, you don't have to maybe test as often, but you should, should continue testing. But this is a rapid fire way to get started on any business really quickly. But the ads that you build have the possibility to grow your business and to have the possibility to, to remain ads that are going to be relevant for you for years. So the ads are going to be there, but you're constantly testing more and different. So you you keep uh, testing and you don't sit your, on your laurels. Even if the ad is working well, you keep finding alternatives. More, more ads, different ads. And then, and then you test. So like you take your best ads and then you continue to test them. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of a combination of version one in there as well, where once you know your best ads and you let them compete, who's going to be the best? And mm -hmm. then you still do the broad targeting. Right, so there's there's a little bit of nuance there. So basically, what we've wh what we've done with this, if we're if we're doing this at for like a nine hundred dollar sprint, basically the idea is conduct a bunch of sprint tests, interview your audiences, or it listen to your sales calls, or listen to customer service, anything that you have, and or go into social media and get the problem statements, or go to AI and get the problem statements run those as ads, and at the end of the $900 sprint, like the, the effort that we do for you, you will get at least one complete ad that you know works, that you know resonates, and then you'll get a plan of action for how to scale that even further. Mm -hmm. Okay. You also talk, talk a lot about harnessing AI for uh, marketing effectiveness. So is this the main use of AI for you to find those problem statements? No, and maybe it's not the main use. use. It's one of many uses. So here's here's a few ways that we use AI in this process, in, in general processes. So number one, um, in this, we're going to use AI and we're going to say, pretend you're a market research, act as a market researcher and identify the problems that types of people will have. Marketing agencies who need a white label media buying firm. Identify the problems that those people have and state the problem as an, as an I wish or I need statement. I wish... White label media buying companies did X, you know, that type of thing. That's one way. But I'll say that Reddit or general social media does better than AI in, in the tests that we've run. But that's actually not true. We have other clients, like I'm thinking about our business. I know how to structure language in our business that makes it far more compelling. But when I do it for other clients, I find that AI does really well. We're doing an interior design firm right now and it's um, mm -hmm. AI is kind of killing it right now. Another use case for AI, generally writing ads. We have a client right now that is, they sell printed homes, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, uh, but it's for like the backyard. Like it's not an actual, what's it called? Granny flat or ADU. It's not, it, there's no plumbing in it. It's mm -hmm. just like, if you want like- Like a shed? A shed, a she shed, a man cave, all those things. Uh -huh. They're selling that. So we use AI for that. And that does better than ads that humans write on mm -hmm. Google search. So we have a chatbot that we uh, created or a chat agent that we developed on top of ChatGPT, which understands copywriting fundamentals, understands the type of ad specs that we need, and understands like um, how to sc scrape websites to understand how an advertiser talks about itself. 
And we use that to do copywriting um, and it's discoverable on ChatGPT, uh, the marketplace on ChatGPT. Um, just search, probably you could, you could search for Brill Media and you can find that copywriting bot. Wow, that's crazy. So your your copywriting bot is is public? Yeah, it, it is public, absolutely. I'm happy to share a link to it. Wow. So why would you share it uh, publicly? I don't know, why not? <laughs> you innovate <laughs> faster than other people can copy you? Eh, I'm not worried about people copying me. That is pretty cool. Yeah, if you go to if you search for brillmedia.co, you can find it's called Copywriter Pro. Uh-huh. Okay. I will definitely uh, search it. All right. So so you you have the system how to iterate the advertising, how to find the problem statements, how to flip them around into solution statement and then test them and then test the image. You put together the ads, you refresh it all the time, you use AI to uh, to write copy for you to do market research for you that is pretty uh, crazy so uh, it sounds a little bit overwhelming uh, to be honest the, it's it's supposed to i guess uh, <laughs> and because, by design <laughs> because it's a complex topic and it took you um, a couple of decades to figure it out so if someone would like to uh, learn from you or hire you or figure out what you do, uh, where should they, they go for more information? Yeah, go to brillmedia.co, B as in boy, R-I-L-L media.co. Um, reach out to us if you're interested in the $900 sprint testing. Um, that's a good first engagement for us and we're happy to do that. It takes about two weeks. You can get your first amazing ad in two weeks and you're going to start to understand what customers want from you. And so we're, we're happy to get started on that. Wow, that is amazing. Well... Robert Brill, the CEO of Brill Media, expert in media buying and actually creating advertisements that work uh, as well. So thanks for coming to the show. And for those of you out there listening, immediately uh, subscribe because this is pure gold that you get from people like Robert and uh, you don't want to miss any episodes in the future. Thanks for coming and thanks for listening.